Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the current installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Real World Data Governance with Bob Seiner. Today Bob is, will be joined by uh, Mark Lynch from IBM uh, to talk about staying non-invasive in your data governance approach. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just ch chat, click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen for that feature. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag RWDG. And if you'd like to engage more with Bob and continue the conversations after the webinar, you can go to community.dataversity.net. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me turn it over to Mark for a word from our sponsor, IBM. Mark, hello and welcome. Thanks very much, Shannon. I will go ahead and share my screen here. Well, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. And uh, again, my name is Mark Lynch. I'm from IBM. I am on the North American Unified Governance and Data Integration Team. Just wanted to take a few minutes to share with you what we see going on in uh, the data governance space today and uh, the challenges we all face and uh, the exciting things that are happening. It's cliche, I know, but I always like to start these discussions with just a reminder of why we all do what we do. And uh, this goes back to, well, decades. Uh, when I was in college and taking some computer classes, um, it was the adage, garbage in, garbage out. And that has not changed. Uh, we like to think that uh, the people are focusing on data quality, but the, the fact is, I know we all experience it daily, that still, if garbage goes in, garbage comes out. So just to level set the starting point, we like to kind of put a graphic up to remind us all of that. At IBM, we find that a lot of, a lot of clients struggle with developing a data strategy and managing data requires a data strategy that is directly connected to achieving strategic objectives. Governance is of course a huge part of that strategy and uh, there can be many drivers of it. In the past, probably the um, most typical was some sort of compliance effort. Uh, today, you know, GDPR, the California Compliance Law, CCPA, uh, many states are adopting them. Those kind of bring it, bring it to the surface via some sort of regulatory action or just um, approach, or maybe uh, clients are being proactive to say, we wanna comply with these, uh, you know, with these regulations. Um, in the past few years, you know, clients realized this was a, organizations realized this was a significant investment and they wanted to capitalize on that. So there's been more of a focus of governance for insights, um, giving access to various data consumers of um, have data in one place where it can de be depended on and trusted. These efforts have been um, in many cases manually intensive. They take a long time and there are pressure on those of us in working in this space to show value to our various organizations. So the governance for insights, something has to happen to make it so we can prove value and show that we're adding to that bottom line, to the profitability of our organizations or the success of our organizations. To do this, we feel like it's a real simple term. You wanna develop business ready data. And it simply means getting data to the right people to the right place and at the right time. We all know the challenges in delivering business ready data though. If you look at the, the left part of this, the left hand part of this slide, it talks about data integration, data quality and governance all on an enterprise level. So it's a matter of finding where that data is and, and moving it to the right place and then providing it to the data citizens who now are many different personas that we deal with on a daily basis. They could be in business areas, financial and marketing analysts, um, data scientists, certainly huge needs for data, but also accountants, um, our finance folks, many data citizens that we are trying to provide data to, but want to have access to data fast. So the efforts become very siloed, very segregated, and IT and governance knows 
that uh, a lot of times the data is not of the best quality when it's being wrangled um, in various areas in a very siloed fashion. So we feel that on an end-to-end -end solution is what's required, including data, data integration, quality, governance, and consumption to create and deliver business-ready data on a single platform or an integrated platform to our, to our data consumers. Gartner Group has talked about this, and you'll see at the bottom of the slide, there's a, 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 a research note that came out last July, and it was entitled Building Data Lakes Successfully. They talked about how an end-to-end -end -end solution is, is required across, again, integration, quality, and governance to give the data, data consumers exactly what they need. I'm not going to read all of these uh, quotes to you, but you see in this article, it talks about why an end-to-end -end solution with integrated component, components is essential. There's various statistics everyone can provide showing what efforts are um, expended in preparing data versus actually utilizing it for gaining insights. But this is a slide I like, and it just kind of illustrates 80% of the time for so many clients of ours is spent in data preparation. Very few iterations at a given project, uh, very few uh, chances to, to analyze to, uh, the data. Um, months turn into quarters, there are delays, um, very few outcomes, very few uh, successful projects. But with business ready data at the foundation, you'll see quicker iteration, cut down considerably on the time it takes to provide your data consumers with data. And you'll have analytics and AI, that would be, uh, we'd like to say, augmented intelligence at a scale and, at scale and speed. Today, everyone's talking about an AI strategy and how to get to that. But really, if we can't eliminate some of the roadblocks of the past with what it takes to wrangle data, what it takes to get it to a trusted state, we won't, we won't achieve AI infusion that we'd like to. So IBM has created a new team recently, and it's called Data Ops. It functions much like uh, DevOps teams of the past in that it, it brings agility to a process of looking at data and trying to provide it to the consumers. Things, uh, this team will, will uh, help with things like assessments of where you are in the process, um, design thinking workshops. It utilizes some of our uh, exercises that we've done in the Watson technology process where we bring clients into data garages and ideate, as we would say, for a day and just brainstorm and talk about what they're trying to achieve. The left-hand part of this slide has our ladder to AI, as we like to call it. It, it um, goes through a few steps that it takes to get to what a situation where AI is actually infused in your organization. And today with data governance, we're talking about the organized stage. And that just means as you see, as you move over to the right-hand part of the slide, the various platforms, the hybrid environments that we're all operating on, data platforms, need to have a unified governance applied to all of them. Again, an end-to-end -end solution, and this will allow looking at things like automated data curation, metadata ingestion, and actually providing consumers with self-services. Now, this doesn't mean that the entire data governance process can be automated and unattended by human. That could never happen. But this is machine and man or woman working together to automate those functions that are kind of labor intensive right now, where there can be repetitive and where AI makes sense in using this. You'll ultimately get to a business ready state and that's what we're trying to do, provide our data consumers with quality data that they can know is trusted. We've also, IBM is also pleased to introduce the Watson Knowledge Catalog into our traditional uh, portfolio of governance products. With our latest release, we've now introduced Watson Technology, those things that provide the uh, data personas of the various users with a stellar interface, um, in the past, as, you, as many of you know, our tooling has been maybe a little bit technical, a little bit um, complicated for the typical business or data citizen to use. And so uh, we've now introduced Watson Technologies and this. very excited about it. If you happen to see it, if you're uh, at one of um, the various uh, conferences we're at, stop by and see our new uh, technology. We're very pleased to show you. So business-ready data 
will only happen if businesses or the data consumers are engaged. I know when I was in the business area prior to joining IBM, if data governance folks came at me with a very invasive approach, I gave them as much as I needed to just to comply, and it wasn't a collaboration. I know Bob's going to talk today about a collaboration and how we can have non-invasive governance, and that will, add, that will allow us to have business-ready data, but more importantly, it will allow the data governance efforts that we're all undertaking to add value to our organizations. Appreciate these few minutes. Uh, my contact information is available on the slide there. Please contact me anytime. Uh, I'd love to discuss your, where you are on the data governance journey. And if, you're, if you want any, any more information about what IBM offers, I'd be happy to provide that. Thank you. And Shannon, I'll turn it back over to you. Mark, thank you so much for this great presentation. And just so you know, uh, Mark will be joining us in the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. So if you have any additional questions, feel free to submit them in the bottom right-hand corner in the Q&A section. And so let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Bob Seiner. Bob is the president and principal of KIK Consulting and Educational Services and the publisher of the Data Administration newsletter, tdan.com. Bob has been a recipient of the DAMA Professional Award for a significant and demonstrable demonstrable contributions to the data management industry. Bob specializes in non-invasive data governance, data stewardship, and metadata management solutions. And with that, I will give the floor to Bob to talk about one of his big specialties, non-invasive data governance. Bob, hello and welcome. Thank you very much, Shannon. Thank you very much, Mark, for your uh, interesting presentation that you provided. Um, and it, the, the way that you ended the presentation is really perfect. I mean, it, it is that people need to have business-ready data for their, for their organizations. And um, the, there's a lot of different approaches, or at least several approaches to data governance. I suggest that organizations consider staying non-invasive in their approach. So today we're going to be talking about how to stay non-invasive in your data governance approach in your organization. Before I get started, there's a couple items that I wanted to share with you. Um, as you know, I do the Real World Data Governance Series. Next month, I'll be talking about building your own data governance tools. So what types of tools and templates can we create that are going to add value to our organization? I talk a lot about non-invasive data governance, and there's a book that I wrote on it published almost five years ago now. That's, please go take a look. If you're interested in more information about non-invasive data governance, I also have uh, a couple learning plans that are available through the Dataversity Training Center, one that focuses on data governance, one that focuses on um, metadata governance as well. Um, Shannon mentioned the newsletter. There's KIK Consulting. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that I will be speaking at the Data Architecture Summit in Chicago. That's one of Dataversity's big events that's taking place in a couple of weeks. I'll also be at Data Governance Vision in December. And I just learned that I will also be speaking at, uh, at the Enterprise Data World event that's going to be taking place in San Diego in the first quarter of next year. So I hope to see you there. Um, so I, I always get started by talking about, well, what are the things that I'm going to present about today? And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you a data governance framework. And we're going to talk about using that framework. In order, there's a lot of different frameworks that are available, but I'm going to complete the framework in a way that I consider to be non-invasive. And you might want to consider looking at the framework and figuring out a way to make it as, uh, as acceptable to the people within your organization as possible. Then I'm going to talk about the three different approaches to, to data governance. I call them the command and control approach, the traditional approach, and then the non-invasive approach. And then I'm going to share with you how it might be possible to kind of create a hybrid model and to use different aspects of the different approaches depending on what's going to be accepted within your organization, within the work culture, you know, to get that business data, uh, business ready data that Mark spoke about at the beginning of the session today. Um, then I'm going to talk about how to sell data governance as something that you're already doing within your organization. That's one of the core tenets of non-invasive data governance is to look to see what people are doing and to expand on what they're doing and help them to understand the role that they play in managing data in the organization. And then we'll talk about finally using the non-invasive approach to win friends and to influence people within your organization. Um, so the first question is, and the first thing that I said I was going to talk about is a framework for data governance. And so the question often comes up, well, why do we need a data governance framework for our organization? And typically, there's really two primary things that we're trying to get across 
within a framework. And those are, what are the core components? What are the, the key activities, the key focal points? Some organizations call it the key themes that you need to address for data governance. And then we want to take a look at those different themes and components from different perspectives. And I learned that from John Zachman when he created the Zachman framework uh, for enterprise architecture. He talked about the who's, what's, why's, when's, where's, and how's of the organization. But the key thing that stuck with me about that was he looked at it from the different perspectives of the organization. So I'll share with you what different levels really need to be addressed as part of your looking at each of those components to successfully implement governance within your organization. Um, we also create frameworks because we need a tool that will help us to make certain that we are addressing each of those core components at each of the different levels. So we want to make certain that we know how we're going to communicate to executives. But then again, also, how are we going to communicate to the stewards of the organization? It may not be the same way. In fact, it's typically not the same way. You have much less time when you're meeting with the executives. You want to make certain that you're addressing things like communications from the different perspectives. So that's an example of where the perspectives really play a big role in, the, uh, in a framework to data governance. And then I'm going to share with you a version of the tool that was completed that really demonstrates what it means to be non-invasive in the approach. And then we'll talk about how the information that you're going to complete within the framework, how that can be evolving and how you might want to use that within your organization. So without further ado, here is the framework that I'm talking about. And if you look at it across the top, we've got some things that are very important to the successful implementation of a governance program. And down the left-hand side, we're focusing on the executive level all the way down to the support level of the organization. And when it comes down to it, we need to really address what goes into each of and every one of those blocks that intersect between the levels and the role and the components that are listed above. And so the first thing that we want to do is we want to identify what are those core components that we need to address as part of our framework, even before we start thinking about how we're going to complete this in a non-invasive way. And from my experience, um, actually, if you had attended a webinar several years ago, I had a different version of the framework where I hadn't added the data column. The data column is really instrumental to the framework. We need to understand what data the executives need to, in order to properly uh, to, to complete their job function all the way down to the operational folks and what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So I included data into the framework. The roles and responsibilities are the backbone of a successful data governance program. People talk about data governance councils and stewards and data owners and what's the role of IT and the executives. We need to define different roles. So that's certainly one of the core components of a successful data governance program. The processes of which you're governing are really important as well because governance by itself isn't going to do much unless it's applied somehow, some way. A lot of organizations create RACI charts or governance activity matrices to talk about the processes and who's going to get involved when and how. That, that aligns perfectly with Mark said, uh, what Mark said about we need to know who does what, when they're going to do it, how they're going to do it. That all needs to be documented within those processes. Communications is critical. A lot of organizations will tell you that communications are 90% of the game when it comes to data governance. We need to communicate effectively. So let's. So we'll talk about communication from the different perspectives. Metrics, how are we going to measure the program? And then certainly the tools, tools that we can create internally, like the ones that I'm going to share in the webinar next month, or the ones that you can acquire from IBM and other companies that provide data governance tools in the market. Um, also then, as part of the framework, I want to discuss the different perspectives. There's the executives, there's the highest level of the organization that we know we're not going to engage day to day with our data governance program, um, but they need to support, sponsor, and understand what the heck it is that we're doing. So we need to have the executives engaged to a certain extent, but we know that they're not going to have time 
to, to run the program. We just want to make sure that they're informed of what they need to be informed of, all the way down to the support level of the organization, the IT group, the legal group, the audit group, and all those different functions that are, are really supporting the organization. Actually, they're already doing governance in a lot of ways. We just need to recognize who they are and call them out. And then the, the balance of the framework basically focuses on looking at each of those core components by each of the levels that we just talked about. So data by level, roles by level, all of the different core components of a successful data governance program as they would be viewed by the different people within the organization. All the way again, as I said before, from the executives all the way down to the data stewards and the people that are performing daily work functions, uh, defining, producing, and using data within the organization. So back to the framework. So this is, again, is the empty framework. And I really call this a, just a data governance framework because you could put anything that you want into those blocks. But if we're gonna talk about it from a non-invasive perspective, I wanted to share this with you. And there is uh, information on TDAN about the framework. We've done other webinars about the non-invasive data governance framework where we've gone block by block and talked about, well, what do we need to consider when it comes to processes that are gonna be understood by our executive level of our organization? Just as an example, just picking off one. So it's really important to define your framework in such a way that it could be general to, as to whether or not you want to take the command and control, you know, assigning people into new roles, you know, take that approach or take a, a non-invasive approach which says, you know what, you're already doing this. We need to find ways to be able to um, help you to better help the organization to govern and to manage our data. So one example that I wanted to dissect here for a second was the roles column. Because again, I, I talked about earlier the fact that the roles are really a core backbone piece of a data governance program. And if you look at it, we need to consider what are the roles going to be from each of the different levels or each of the different perspectives of the organization. And so when you, when you go across from executive and down roles, you see we talk about the leadership and the steering committee. Or at the strategic level, we're talking about a data governance council. At a tactical level, the data owners or the people that have knowledge about domains or subject areas of data, down to the operational and the support roles of the organization. And if you've attended my webinars in the past, this diagram is probably something that's very familiar to you. And if you look at it, it basically imitates the framework. Down the right-hand side, it goes from the executive level to the strategic level, to the tactical, operational, and the support level. And I will be spending the whole, or at least the half of a day at Enterprise Data World talking about a complete set of roles and responsibilities when it comes to data governance. I could talk to this slide for the whole session. I'm not going to do that here, but what I wanted to point out was that how the roles and responsibilities plug into the framework that you're defining for your data governance program. And so let's take a look at the communications column. Um, there's differences in the ways that we communicate with the different levels of the organization. You know, what is important from the executive perspective? We need them to support, sponsor, and understand what the heck it is we're doing when we're implementing data governance. And in fact, I typically list that as the very first best practice, is that if we don't have executive support, sponsorship, and most importantly, understanding of what it is we're doing, that our data governance program is going to be at risk. You know, and if you look down the additional items in the communication column, you can see at a strategic level with the council, we want to report status, we want to evaluate things, we want them to help us to prioritize things. So you can fill in the framework in a way that makes sense to your organization, hopefully keeping the idea of staying non-invasive as prevalent as possible in the, in the approach that you're taking to data governance. 
And then the data governance communication tool that I've shared in the past looks like this. I'm going to blow it up here in a minute so you can see it a little bit closer. But the point of this is that there's orientation communications that needs to take to place to all the different roles and responsibilities that we've defined within our organization, within data governance within our organization. And then there's the onboarding, when we're going to start getting people engaged and asking them to do things. We can fill out a list of different things that we need to do as far as onboarding communication is concerned. And the truth is, somebody needs to, to take care of that. Somebody needs to complete that information, and often that's the job of the data governance office or the data governance administrator is to make certain that you have those tools and templates and you have those artifacts and things that will communicate effectively with the different levels of different people across the organization. And then there's the ongoing communication. So using a tool or a template like this helps you to even dissect the framework a little bit further and to address your communications specifically based on the different perspectives that we shared. And so I'm blowing up a, a piece of the picture here so you can see that under each of the roles that are defined, it says support, it says tactical, it says operational. So we want to make certain that we're covering this aspect of what we are doing as well. So the framework, again, becomes a very important tool for us to make certain that we're setting up all of the appropriate components of a successful governance program, but we're doing it from all of the different perspectives and stakeholders of people in the organization that care about uh, care about the the different components, the different things that we're talking about. So now I want to switch gears here for a second and talk about three different approaches and what the different pro approaches, what are some of the differences between the approaches. And oftentimes I just refer to them as I did before, the command and control, you will do this approach. Um, people are busy. People have day jobs. <laughs> people have day jobs and night jobs for some organizations. But the fact is, just to be told you're going to do it is very invasive, is very uh, threatening to the work culture of the organization. The second approach I talk about is the traditional approach. And I oftentimes refer to that as being um, the, the field of dreams approach. And the line from the field of dreams is, if you build it, they will come. So to take a traditional approach to data governance is to set up a program and expect that people in the organization are going to fit into the roles and do the things that they, they want. And non-invasive takes a different approach, and it says, you know, you may already be doing some of these things. Let's identify who's doing what so that we can formalize accountability for data rather than handing it to people as something new. But so the thing is that those three different approaches, they all have the same goals. They're all focusing on the same things. It's just the approach that's different, how you're considering this within your organization that really makes up the approach. But we're all looking to improve data quality, improve the understanding of the data, how well it's protected. You know, we, we want to make better use of the data, things that Mark referred to earlier on in this session. Um, we want to transform the organization to becoming a data-centric organization. One of the key things that we need to do in order to do that is to implement governance or to formalize accountability for how people are managing data in the organization. So what I mentioned was there's three really three different approaches, the command and control approach, the traditional approach to data governance, and the non-invasive approach to data governance that I suggest because it seems to be the most practical and pragmatic way of adopting data governance into your organization. In fact, I created a framework comparison chart, just like I had created the framework itself. And if you look at this, you can see I take the command and control, the traditional and the non-invasive approaches, and lay them out across the top. And then I took those core components that were at the top of the framework and put them down the left side. And what I want to do is I want to highlight some things for you. For example, in the roles, in the command and control approach, people are assigned into the new responsibility. In traditional approach, people are identified into roles. Oh, we, we think that this person will be the best steward, so we're going to, to make them the steward for this data. But in the non-invasive approach, we're going to recognize what people already do. And a good example of that would be in a university or higher ed uh, setup where you've got the registrar's office that's responsible for student data. 
well, it would make sense that we would recognize that and that we would um, have the key data owners or data subject matter experts as being somebody from that office. So that's just one way of being able to break down the, the differences here and go in the wrong direction. Let's see. So command and control people are assigned. They're given new levels of authority, while in a traditional approach, people are told that they have a new role, and they're also given new levels of authority, which feels more invasive or more threatening to what they are already are doing. People aren't typically sit, sitting around. Their time is occupied, if not 100%, you know, something above 100% these days when companies are lean and mean. And then there's the non-invasive approach, where we really recognize people for their relationship to the data, and then we help them to understand why that relationship to, to the data is important, and we formalize the levels of authority that should already be in place within the organization. So again, just looking from the roles perspective, um, there's a lot of different communications depending on the way that you select, the approach that you select to implement governance within your organization. Just one more example from the, the comparison um, framework slide, um, the difference in the communications. In command and control, you're told you will do this versus you should do this versus, you know what, you're already doing this. Let's see if we can find a way to, uh, to formalize what you're doing rather than make it feel as though we're handing you something that's brand new. And so again, in the command and control approach, governance is mandatory, you will do this. In the traditional approach, it's important, you should do this. And then in the non-invasive approach, it's based on people's, uh, their responsibility is based on their relationship to the data. So the messaging truly is that you're already doing this within your organization. So it might make sense for you to follow an entirely non-invasive approach, or you might come from an environment where command and control is the only way that's going to work within your organization. The fact is that you don't need to select a single approach. In fact, you can um, select the components of the approach that you like and focus on them and make some of them traditional, make some of them command and control, and even others non-invasive. So we want to, again, use that approach comparison matrix and select the boxes from that matrix that really best represent what we need in order to succeed at our organization. So again, coming back to the matrix, we potentially can pick things from different columns. And so the answer to the question there of, is there anything wrong with taking a hybrid approach, a hybrid approach is no. I mean, there's actually, you want to do what's going to give you the, the highest likelihood of success within your organization. I prefer that, or I would suggest that you take a strong look at the non-invasive approach as parts of that. But if there's other things that make better sense to your organization, by all means, consider those and, and implement governance in a way that's going to be accepted and acceptable to people within your organization. So again, the command and control approach is very authoritative. You know, people will have to follow the approach. It's strictly going to be coming from the top down. Um, and it's all about controlling the data. And, and so if you use those words, people are going, to, are going to come to use those words. And they're going to say that control, they think that data governance is going to get in the way or it's going to interfere or it's going to take longer for us to get to the information that we need. So the command and control approach is kind of in your face, the iron fist. Um, we are going to do this and you are going to follow the law versus the traditional approach. As I said before, if you build it, they will come. The program is well-defined. It's sold to management. You've set up your council and you've, you've clearly defined things that need to be defined. But again, you're hoping people are going to gravitate to it rather than handing it to them as something that's brand new or forcing it down their throat and saying, hey, I don't care that you're busy already you know, 60 hours a week, you've got to take this role on as well. So that's much more invasive. And I suggest staying to the non-invasive approach, which is really there's less reason for the stewards to push back if they're using data that has to be, that is classified in such a way that the handling of the data needs to be um, specific. You need to hold specific data um, private. Then they don't have a choice of saying that they don't want to protect that data. They, they are, by the fact that they have that relationship to the data, to data that must be held private, um, 
they become a steward of that data. They need to know the rules associated with that data. They need to follow the rules. And typically in organizations these days, you need to be auditable when it comes to that. How well do the stewards know the rules? Um, so ideally, you can take each person at what their relationship is to the data and help them to become better stewards of that data rather than handing them new titles, handing them new roles, and making them feel like this is over and above the things that they're present, uh, presently doing. And is, honestly, the non-invasive approach is, is really hard for leadership to reject it. In fact, they may, you may uh, cause a, a couple of curious looks when you go into them and tell them that, hey, we're already governing data. We're just not doing it formally, uh, efficiently, or effectively. Um, they're going to look at you differently than if you come to them and say that data governance is something that's brand new. If you say, tell them that there's things that we can leverage, um, they might think it's going to be hard for them to reject the idea of governing data that way. And as I said before, the stewardship is based on the relationships to the data. Um, in this way, in this manner, with a non-invasive where we're looking for people's relationships to the data, you have complete coverage of the organization. You're not just having a specific group in the organization or a specific subject being governed. If you can identify and recognize who all the people are that define, produce, and use data across the organization and help them to do it better, that's non-invasive. That's what we're trying to achieve here in, in making it feel or not making it feel like it's something that's over and above what people are presently doing. So really the biggest difference between each of these three approaches comes down to the stewards. It comes down to we're going to assign versus identify versus recognizing people as stewards within the organization. I can guarantee you that there's people in your organization that at least at some point had accountability for the data for data they defined, produced, or used. So if you're looking at their relationships and you're um, formalizing accountability that way, you don't have to designate each of them a steward. Heck, everybody's a data steward, and I've said that many times before. The fact is, potentially, everybody in the organization is a data steward. So the, the concept of selling data governance as something that we're already doing within the organization. Well, let's look at the definition of non-invasive data governance that I've been using for years. It, it, it is the practice of applying formal accountability and behavior like I was just talking about. We're going to do it through non-invasive roles, so we're not going to change people's title to what their roles are within the program. We're going to apply governance to processes first and foremost. And if we need to create new processes, that's fine as well. We're going to govern those as well. But your organization probably wouldn't be where it is today if it didn't have at least decent levels of processes and procedures and, and standard operating procedures and those types of things. You, you may find that there are some deficiencies to those, but where I would start is by applying the roles and responsibilities uh, to the, the, uh, the existing steps of the process and making certain that everybody knows exactly what they need to do. And the idea of non-invasive and or any form of governance is that we want to assure that the definition, production, and usage of data does all those things. You know, it, it's regulatory compliance, like Mark talked about, security, privacy, protection, and quality of data. So we're going to apply governance, but we're going to do it in such a way that people don't feel threatened by it. Really, that's what data non-invasive describes, or each of the approaches describe how we're going to apply governance to the organization. And with non-invasive data governance, the goal is always to be as transparent, as supportive, and as collaborative as possible in the way that we're setting up data governance. So let's look at some additional ways to sell data governance is what we're already doing. Well, I have written articles on TDAN where I talk about what you should tell management and what you shouldn't tell management. And I'm going to summarize those here quickly for you. The first thing that we should do is we should tell our management that we're already governing data, but we're doing it informally. And there's ways that we can formalize what we're doing rather than making this feel like this is brand new to the organization. We can improve our governance. We don't necessarily need to spend a lot of money on data governance. And in fact, some people will say it shouldn't be called data governance. It should be called people governance because we're governing people's behavior as it as associated to the data. You know, we don't necessarily need to spend a lot of money on it. Certainly tools will help to enable the success of our program. But I've seen successful programs that don't have a data governance tool yet. 
So we just need to start somewhere. So so rest assured or, or get your management to be rest assured that there's already levels of governance that are taking place and we need to formalize them and they might be an effective way instead of trying to create something that's entirely top down and, and tells people that you know, it doesn't matter what you're presently doing, you need to do these things as well. So what are some of the things that you shouldn't tell your management? Well, the first thing you shouldn't tell them is that data governance is a huge challenge because honestly, when it really comes down to it, if you do it incrementally, it's not a huge challenge. If you can formalize people's accountability that already exists and help them to help the organization to get a better grip on their data, then you don't need to spend a whole lot of money doing that. So we can avoid selling this as a huge challenge. Our management will think of data governance in the way that we relate it to them. If we sell it as a huge challenge, that's the way they'll consider it. If you go into them and say, we're already governing data, you might get them to sit forward in their chair and to listen to you and say, what, uh, what do you mean by that? How does that impact me and what we're trying to do here? Now, emphasize that data governance is a people solution. It's not a technical solution. There are companies that buy tools first and then start trying to fit their program into the tool. My suggestion is make certain you know what your requirements are before you go out and buy the technology tools to support you. And as I said before, it's, maybe it should be called people governance because it's people's behavior that's being governed and not the data. And, and you can also emphasize to your management that data governance is an evolution. It's not something that's necessarily going to work perfectly right out of the gate, but it becomes an evolution and it's not a revolution to your organization. You're going to learn by doing, you're going to improve by uh, uh, assessing what you've done and looking for uh, better ways or new ways to do things. So one final note about selling, when it comes down to it, people will perceive data governance the way that it's explained to them. And that includes everybody in your organization, including your senior leadership. So people like you and me, we need to make certain that with the messages that we're sharing with people at the highest level of the organization, um, it instill confidence in what data governance is doing rather than this, this level of misunderstanding, not interest or non-interest I mean, we want to get them to understand that we're doing this and that we can do it better. That's why I suggest staying non-invasive in the way that you're implementing data governance within your organization. The last subject I wanted to talk about was winning friends and influencing people. And I just show a, co a copy of the cover of the book because of the subtitle of the book. And that is The Path of Least Resistance and Greatest Success. So in terms of least resistance, you take the perspective that you're already governing data you recognize people into roles, you apply governance instead of making everything a brand new process or having what we call a data governance process. Typically there's many. Any process typically could be considered a form of governance. We're gonna formalize accountability and really limit the, the uh, cost in order to achieve certain levels of success. And in terms of the greater success piece of that statement, you know, this is a proven approach organizations have used. It's very practical and pragmatic, gives you a lot of opportunities to measure things in your organization as to where are we adding value to our organization. So show value from a limited investment, um, leverage existing forms of governance, IT security, uh, uh, data access uh, authority, those things are already forms of governance. Call them out as being forms of governance. And that's why I say go to our management and say, we're already governing data, but we're doing it haphazardly. We can put more structure to what we're doing. And so know the things to say to them and the things not to say to them. That is some of my suggestions as to how you can win friends and influence people when it comes to, uh, to implementing your data governance program. So in this, in this um, webinar, we've talked about a couple things. Again, thank you to Mark Lynch from IBM. Um, we talked about the data governance framework. We talked about the different approaches to governance, considering the use of a hybrid approach and how we should sell this as something that we're already doing within our organization. And lastly, we talked about using the non-invasive approach to win friends and to influence people. And with that, I am going to turn it back over to Shannon to see if we have any questions today. Oh wait, one more thing. I plan to be in the Dataversity community um, after the webinar. If you have questions, I'll be there for a little bit after the webinar, so I hope to see you there. 
Love it. Thank you, Bob. And thank you, Mark, uh, so much for these great presentations. Just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will be sending a follow-up email for this webinar by end of day Monday with links to the slides, links to the recording, and anything else requested throughout. Um, diving in here, um, Mark, there was a question that came in uh, uh, right away from your presentation asking for a definition of data garbage. Data garbage would be um, data that lacks quality that, that is incorrect. In other words, like you're looking at, at some outcome and you see two versions of the truth, which one is correct and which one isn't. One obviously that got you to the incorrect version is there's some issue, data quality likely, and that was garbage in and then you got garbage out. Does that answer it, Shannon? Actually, actually, I think that that picture that Mark had shared of the garbage is what uh, left a, a thought. I think he was mentioning data garage, not data garbage. So, Mark, maybe you can share what you meant by the data garage. Okay, there were there were quite a few comments in the um, chat about our data garage. Technically, it's a data ops garage, but again, it uh, this is something that we have. Um, it's evolved from the Watson Technology Centers, and it's a day workshop, or it could be um, more than a day, where you bring members of your team, both from business and, um, you know, uh, technical areas, and um, it's you use our design, meet with our design folks. Uh, it's agendas are set, obviously, before you get there, but the idea is that you're going to um, go through the process of solving a business problem. It's not necessarily going to lead you to um, you know buying products or tooling it's going to talk about people process and technology and try to get you on a path of solving the business problem that that the group is facing or problems or challenges so I think the garage and the garbage both needed to be defined thank you yes thank you uh, so um, so additionally so can uh, federate so by um, getting into your presentation here, can a federated data governance operating model be non-invasive? And Mark, please join in at any moment with any of these questions. Yeah, and so it's um, federated um, can certainly be non-invasive, although certain roles may be a little bit more invasive than others. I would think that it, it all, again, all comes down to how you define your roles and responsibilities and how you're federating it across your organization. So. You know, yes, you can apply it, but uh, you may be choosing, as I said, a, more of a hybrid method for part some of the roles associated with federated. Yeah, and, and Bob, there's a little confusion about federated versus non-invasive. Maybe define the, the difference. Well, you know, I don't, to be honest with you, I don't work with too many clients that call it federated. Um, it, it's almost as though... Uh, and, and so just to give an example of one, they were, it was almost like self-service um, data governance, and they were such a large organization that they wanted to leave levels of authority off in different parts of the organization. Again, I think that, you know, it, depending on how you define federated, um, and, and I don't have a necessarily clear definition. Mark, can you um, share with us what your thoughts are on federated data governance? I guess I just, in my head, always think of federated as pushed out, <laughs> not a real technical term, but, but just that. And I think the, the organizations where I've seen it work is certain things on an enterprise level have to be uh, centralized, and then other things can be left, as you just described, Bob, within um, you know, the various areas. So it all depends on the level of governance you're talking about and whether it's something that you know, crosses all domains and areas or not. But still, the truth is that you still have executive, strategic, tactical, operational, and support levels of your organization. So for that reason, the roles still need to take place, whether you're pushing it out or you're centralizing it and bringing it in to one area. Um, yes, I do. I still feel as though federated can be represented within the framework that we shared. And, and for those, the non-invasive approach is just really about getting buy-in regardless of what role or level you're in. And again, we find that buy-in will happen if you can prove value. Yep. All right, so how do you enable data stewards to reduce data rot, redundant, outdated, and trivial through non-invasive data governance? Well, that's interesting. I've never heard of data rot spelled out that way. Give me those three words again. 
redundant, outdated, and trivial. So how do we get stewards? So first of all, there have to be rules associated with how long data has to be kept. And uh, some organizations these days, if the data is trivial, they're not even collecting the data because they need to focus on data that is non-trivial data uh, as uh, as at least a focus. Um, I, I find that you know they um, the stewards need to know what the rules are, and then at the tactical and the op- and the strategic levels as well, there need to be rules or ULES as to what data we want to keep around and and how it's there. Um, the data becomes rot. <laughs> it, it becomes the data garbage that Mark was talking about when there's no clear definition put to that data, when people don't really understand the data and it's just sitting there and it's not being used. So that's, uh, yeah, I think stewards can play a big role in that. Mark, anything you want to add to that? No, I think that's a good response. Thanks, Bob. And so, uh, um, can you, uh, both of you, I think it would be a good question for both of you. How, can you provide a specific example of what a data governance tool is? Is it a technology? Is it a spreadsheet? Is it a process? What's the data governance? Mark, you want to hit that one first? I mean, you know, at IBM, we have many tools in our suite of products, and we're, you know, it's, we're, um, with the Watson, the slide that I put up with our Watson Knowledge Catalog, we're so excited about it. Uh, we've just invested incredibly in the last two years at IBM and our tooling. So I, I'd love to talk for an hour about our tooling, but we find with clients that it's, it's people, process, and technology. So certainly the technology is the tooling. It's what people have mentioned, the catalog, a data quality tool, uh, master data management, all those things. Um, but without the correct people and process in place, they're going to be useless and you won't get anything out of them. So. Um, Certainly, okay. tooling is important, but it's one third of what one of my colleagues calls the holy trinity. Okay, uh, the people, process, and technology. Well, I, I call it out in the framework for a specific reason, and I agree with everything Mark said. But I add to that as well that a tool can be anything that you develop internally that can be used or potentially reused to assist in an effort. So if you create a common data matrix, a tool that I provide often as an inventory and accountability tool, or you create the pyramid diagram that I use to describe to you the different roles, or you create a communication matrix that says, this is how and what we're going to communicate to the different people of the organization based on the different things that we're communicating. I consider those all to be tools, data dictionaries, business glossaries, those are all tools. So even just having a formal process defined becomes a tool, especially if you can then engage the appropriate people at the appropriate time. So data governance tools could be any of these things. Um, and, and so you're going to get value from them. Um, it's just you know, one thing to consider is that it's an investment, and we don't want to make investments kind of willy-nilly. We want to make certain that we have requirements for what we're going to use these tools for they can add tremendous value, the ones that Mark talked about, and that those can add tremendous value to implementing an effective data governance program. Yeah, Bob, I agree with you. Um, great points, and I think that's early on in the journey, yeah, anything you use, spreadsheet, anything you can do to get started, but you will reach a point where you're going to be um, looked at to say, okay, what are we getting from this? And that's where you'll have to scale the efforts, and that's where more, more involved tooling has to, has to be looked at. Yep. Yep. All righty, and if you have questions, feel free to submit them in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a comment from the questioner saying, I totally recognize that you can't have tools without people and policies. That's, you know, uh, very, very understandable. Um, so, let me comment just on that real quickly, if I could. So a policy is a tool. And if you look in the framework, if you look in the version of the framework that I shared that had under executive level and under the tools, I believe that I had something about tools and directives and things like that. So that is very good understanding. These are all tools that we use. We just don't always look at them as being tools. Uh, 
Alrighty, and there was a question here about uh, getting access to the uh, matrices and such that you provide, and I will definitely send that out in the follow-up email that will go out by end of day Monday as well. Um, lots of comments going on in here. There's uh, uh, everyone's pretty quiet on questions today. I'm shocked. Usually, it's so much busier. Yeah, and that was because um, everyone was having fun with the uh, the data garage. Uh, it's true. Okay. We're, we're gonna have Jay Leno as our spokesperson. That was a great idea. <laughs> I started thinking immediately, immediately of Leno's garage, and you yeah, know, that came up. That's a great idea. idea. And so, you know what? I got a question for you, Mark. If that's okay. Um, sure. The when you're talking about unified data governance, maybe you can help people to understand what they mean. I agree uh, with how I don't, I'm not sure how you define it. That's why I'm asking. But the unified having the framework. And following a consistent approach and how we implementing it, how we implement it, become a big piece of that. Can you can you share with us um, what your thoughts are on that? Yeah, and we we recommend a similar framework. Um, you know, just looking at just various again the people, process, and technology. But what we found, even in our own sort of um, suite of tools at IBM, we have everyone who approached. Uh, you know, whether it was master data management or data quality, it was it was done in very siloed ways. And so those efforts weren't looked to be integrated, even within our own, you know, and we're the so-called experts. So you just want to make sure that as you work through the framework, and the framework certainly helps you do that, that wherever possible, you're looking to integrate and leverage all aspects, be it, you know, the data catalog and how that interacts with uh, your data quality efforts and um, and that sort of thing. Does that answer the question, Bob? Yeah, it did. Thank you. All right. Do you um, recommend a data enterprise data dictionary or glossary to drive common data understanding? I'm not sure how you're going to do it otherwise. <laughs> Actually, you can have a metadata repository, which can house both the dictionary and the glossary. Um, yeah, I I recommend that you that people understand the data. That in order to improve the quality of the data, that's going to come down to the definition of the data, and that becomes the the data dictionaries for the different applications and data resources that you're documenting. Glossaries, on the other hand, you know those being more of a high level semantic understanding of the organization and what the organization does. I, I like to think of the idea of connecting the glossaries to the dictionaries so that once you give people to focus on the business terms, that they can then dig down into the specific data and what does this data mean and what's it called. So, yes, I do recommend, uh, recommend the dictionaries and the glossaries to improve the understanding of the data. Mark, thoughts? Uh, just that whatever effort you're undertaking, and it sounds like this would be very early in the process, make sure that it's tied to a business outcome, that you're trying to solve a business problem and work from work that way. And yes, I, I agree with everything you said, Bob, but that's the only thing I would add is the starting point should be a business problem you're trying to solve. Yep. Uh, can you define data that is structured data elements? Well, there's, you know, people use the term structured and unstructured data. Structured data, typically, they, they, there's a lot of conversation about this, but structured data is basically the columns and the rows of, of, uh, of data in, in tables. But with the unstructured data oftentimes is considered content, records, information. You know, they don't, people don't, um, you know, data can be in a lot of different formats. The unstructured formats are not the ones that you can run a query uh, or, or write a simple SQL query against. Um, so, I, I mean, structured data is data that resides in your systems primarily, and unstructured data would could be considered you know, any type of data that is not structured. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. Just think of your traditional databases, as you said, Bob Rose, columns. That's your structured emails, PDFs, that sort of thing is unstructured. And in, da in data governance today, you're called on to, um, to govern both. So it, it used to be just certain types of data, but now it's any and all, and that could include, you know, uh, videos, so. Right, audios, videos, any anything that, you know, records, that's a big upcoming topic. Yeah. Um, those are all 
uh, they all could be, they have structure to them, but people still tend to call them unstructured data. Right. And then they're semi-structured, but we won't get into that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Bob and Mark, thank you so much for these, again, for these great presentations. That does bring us very close to the top of the hour here. And thanks to our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. We just love it, as course. And again, uh, if you'd like to meet up with Bob and, or continue the conversation, you can go to Dataversity or community, excuse me, community.dataversity.net. And just a reminder, once again, that I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Monday with links to the slides, links to the recording of the session, uh, and the uh, Bob's matrices and so on and so forth. And thanks to IBM for sponsoring and helping to make all these happen. Happy thanks, to everybody. Thank thanks, everybody. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Bob.